This is nothing more than a light being turned on and off, a perfectly ordinary operation. Except for one incredible thing, the light is being turned on and off by this laboratory technician. She throws no switch, she pushes no button, she's doing it strictly with brain waves. This is Dr. Edmund Duan, an Air Force physicist who has been working with brainwave ideas. Dr. Duan, exactly what is a brainwave? Well, uh, apparently the brain, in uh, doing whatever it seems to be doing, uh, gives out very small voltages. And uh, these can be detected at the scalp with a pair of electrodes placed in the back of the head. And uh, when these are amplified several million times, you can see them on a oscilloscope or print them out on paper or write them on paper. And we call these brain waves. Dr. that young lady. Now, exactly how does she turn that light on and off? Well, she does it by uh, changing her brain waves. You see uh, the algorithm, the 10 cycle per second rhythm, uh, tends to be on if you're in a relaxed state. But you can turn it off by. Turn it off? You can turn off, or I should really say, you cut down these waves significantly by uh, visual trying to look through the eyelids and trying to imagine something. Now, those electrodes in the back of her head, her head uh, actually pick up those brain waves, and uh, these go to an amplifier, or several amplifiers, that increase the voltage several million times, up to the point where they will make that switch uh, turn on and off. And of course, once you have a switch that you can turn, turn on and off, you can plug anything you wish to it. And so, uh, it is possible by concentrating in a very peculiar way to send Morse code messages. In fact, if you like a demonstration, I can show you. That's how it works. Now, this young lady will attach some electrodes to my scalp, which will pick up the brain waves. And the wires will go through a cable to a machine on the other side of this wall, which will record the voltages. And Joe Witham will be out there watching the excursions of the needle and I will send him long and short bursts of algorithm, in other words, dots and dashes, and communicate to him in Morse code. Just like uh, um, uh, Norbert Wiener, he, he uh, thought uh, that the way this should be used uh, was uh, for uh, uh, prosthetic purposes. <coughs> um, and in particular, he was thinking that this, he, he wanted to develop it for people with lock, lock in syndrome. You know, like the diving bell and the butterfly, that they could, uh, somebody like totally paralyzed could communicate with their brain. Uh, he figured out soon thereafter that just blinking, you know, just like <laughs> in the not, you know, not in the movie, the blinking was, you, you saw how long it took him to get the oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, <clears throat> although um, 
they did uh, a few years later uh, uh, hook it up to a computer and and he uh, did Morse, Morse code. He was more adept at the time and did it more quickly. And the first word uh, printed out by, uh, by uh, the uh, computer uh, uh, in brainwaves was uh, cybernetics. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, in honor of his uh, good friend, Norbert Weiner. He, he was, they called each other daily for the last four or five years of, of, of uh, Wiener's life. And of course they were in the, um, um, in the Boston area together. Uh, you got, this was the, uh, you know, the local uh, paper uh, write-up, uh, but it spread pretty quickly. This was the Washington Post, um, October 21st, 1964. <coughs> so, um, uh, the thing is, he became well known for this, and he started sort of touring and doing kind of like science co conventions and performing with brainwaves. So it's like so this. He, but he just knew that um, that a, a, you know you could probably make music out of it, <clears throat> and so it was under his uh, motivation that he went looking for somebody to make. Uh, a composer, because it, the good thing was that he was a, uh, a scientist, even no matter how deeply he was into uh, performing quite difficult music, he knew, he had, well, probably because he was into performing quite difficult music, he had a, uh, a respect, I mean, he talked about it, he had just sort of this ingrained respect for composers, for what they could do, and he knew that he couldn't do it, he didn't know what it would be, but he just had an idea that, you know, this was this was a possibility to make music out of brainwaves. He approached uh, some of these modern composers at at, um, uh, at Brandeis, and they thought he was nuts. <laughs> and then, and uh, but when he uh, approached uh, Alvin, he, Alvin goes, "Oh, I'm not doing anything. I don't have any ideas myself." You know, so uh, and and it uh, it became his first mature what uh, Alan sees in retrospect his first mature composition. It had to do with this whole sort of science um, music thing that he developed, especially through the uh, through the next uh, five years or so. Um, so it was really important. Uh, I don't think any. The other Norbert Wiener connection. Uh, uh, Edmund didn't know about this, and um, and Alvin uh, didn't either. But there was the brainwave scene, and the, the <coughs> Norbert Wiener. Oh uh, yeah, the Edmund Dewan said that the Norbert Wiener was for uh, scientists and engineers what John Cage was for artists and musicians. He was this sort of nonlinear approach to mathematics was like very li liberating. Um, <clears throat> the uh, connection w with the um, Forbidden Planet. Um, uh, if you know the film, you'll uh, you'll know this uh, this scene. Um, <clears throat> uh, the the music and the sound score was done by uh, Louis and Bibi Barron who had worked on the, the uh, uh, music for uh, magnetic tape project uh, that Williams Mix came out of. Uh, they were the ones that, support all, uh, that supplied all the sound. This is quite a few years earlier than the Rainbow Peace. Uh, like yeah, seven. yeah, this is, well, uh, <clears throat> this is, the film was what, 1955? That's right. Yeah, and, uh, but music for magnetic tape project was uh, the early 50s. So, and in fact, they, <clears throat> uh, Louis and Bibi, uh, the uh, composers, uh, electronic composers and uh, experimental composers sort of kind of s split on what they think about this film. <laughs> um, and the, where, where they, the, the sides they come down on are, uh, <clears throat> uh, because it's all, you know, uh, it's all electronic. Uh, all the sounds are electronic. Um, uh, they either uh, they hate it because
because it, so it was the, the film that cemented this connection of electronic music with outer space, <laughs> or they, they really like it because it introduced the, the, the larger audiences to that you could have electronic music and, and sounds be, uh, be captivating. Um, but yeah, uh, Louis Berger, uh, his idea of circuitry and sort of this animality of, of circuits on, uh, on Norbert Wiener's uh, writings. So, and in fact, they, um, <clears throat> it's not, not well known that uh, B.B. and Louis Barron actually had a piece, uh, their own piece within the music for magnetic tape uh, project, apart from supplying the sounds uh, for the other composers. So here's the, uh, the diagram for, <coughs> um, um, for music for solo performer. These are the electrodes. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is Cybersonics amps. Uh, <coughs> so that would be a later version. Gordon Mama, the composer, uh, who had this sort of little company with another person that, that called Cybersonics. Uh, <coughs> it's not... Uh, not till later that you can see this assistant here. On the first first version of it, that assistant was John Cage. Alvin <laughs> 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 was pretty cool having John Cage as an assistant. Uh, so it's not really music for solo performer because there's actually somebody else uh, in there uh, as well. Um, but the uh, let's see. Um, but it. You got to realize that it is a cybernetic piece. Um, it's not usually talked. Uh, Alvin stuff is not usually talked about it, but it is a cybernetic piece. Um, uh, cybernetics were all around through the Boston area because of Wiener's uh, uh, presence. Uh, <clears throat> um, the, the way that the circuit works, uh, the feedback. Now it's not like feedback like Jimi Hendrix. You know feedback, but uh, in a uh, the the feedback loop that's happening is that uh, <clears throat> this is detected uh, uh, the alpha state is detected by the electrodes. They are uh, highly amplified. Uh, uh, at this point, they go into um, they're they're at a sub audible. Uh, Range, so they're actually used to drive, uh, drive speakers, uh, and then the, the, the <clears throat> so you you would have to speed them up to actually have them in the audible range. So the ones that are audible are actually sort of pre-recorded material. But the, <clears throat> the um, it was when Alvin was in the uh, was in the studio. And was practicing with the brainwave. He had the, the screen off, and he and he saw, you know, saw the speaker move. And so that was uh, where he got the idea that he could use the uh, speakers not at, to make sound, but as a driver for something that would make sound. So. Um, um, yeah, he he. Um, but the, the way that it uh, becomes a uh, circuit, he he spread out the <clears throat> the sound making things throughout the space. There's a whole thing where sort of spatiality that gets, you know, for Alvin is is like a kind of a New England countryside thing. Well, seriously, it's like a New England kind of transcendentalist uh, countryside that is mapped upon the, the studio and or a performance space here. And the, the way that it uh, becomes a, a circuit is he doesn't know until he hears it that he's performing. Um, you know, he doesn't know that he's in alpha state till he hears it himself. So it's this, and then once he hears it, it you know, he knows that he's going in the right direction. So there's this sort of circularity that that constitutes the uh, circuit. The thing, the thing is that the <clears throat> um, uh, no, 
Now this this is for other pieces in the uh, in this period of that album is that he didn't he didn't want John, he thought that everybody he wanted to make a new contribution. Uh, at the time, he didn't like the idea that you know doing sort of a synthesizer piece where you go put a something in the front and you get a sound coming out the you know the back. <laughs> so he thought there there's got to be some other way about it, and he he started thinking about it as sort of breaking open the circuit and letting some air in. So <clears throat> so you. Um, so he sort of goes in and out of uh, electronic circuits and acoustic space. So he uses the acoustic space as you would uh, use it to modulate a sound within within a circuit. So he was sort of uh, uh, going in and out of these two states of energy, electromagnetic, uh, electronic, and uh, uh, acoustical, acoustical space. So <clears throat> Um, so, yeah, the, the, it's, uh, I won't get into that transduction <laughs> in kind, trans, transduction in degree, but, <clears throat> but just sort of going, the important thing is that he started thinking about a circuit in a different way and that sort of different presences, uh, uh, that the uh, resonant sound could be, uh, you know, for the, the energy that uh, was sort of continuous coming in, in and out of this whole process that the space, the space you are in, the room you are in now, uh, I'm sitting in a room is the same, the same thing. <clears throat> He's uh, speaking uh, into, uh, uh, let me see. He's <clears throat> speaking into a, um, Speaking, does, does everybody know I'm sitting in a room? Uh, it's his most famous piece when he, uh, I was at this thing at Wesleyan where anytime anybody would mention that piece, he'd cross himself. <laughs> you know, because he, he, you know, he goes, I've done other things. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> the, um, um, but yeah, so he's, uh, going uh, in and out of acoustic space and electronic space uh, with the I am sitting in a room um, continually. And <clears throat> so that's Norbert Wiener, uh, good friends with uh, uh, Edmund Dewan. Uh, this guy right here is Amar Bose. You may know him because of the sort of little electronics line that, uh, uh, that he has. So, um, <coughs> in the Boston area, this is where, this was sort of like the Silicon Valley of the hi-fi industry. You know, the Boston area was, uh, with uh, MIT in particular, was where the uh, audiophile stereo systems hi-fi uh, uh, started being developed. <coughs> Bose was part of this. It was sort of that there was this kind of uh, a lot of the high high fi folks, and on one side, Bose on the other, <clears throat> and the the main. Um, uh, can I get some water? Very. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> uh, Bose. Um, well, the, the hi-fi, this is sort of the difference between John Cage and Alvin Lussier as well. The, the, the speakers um, uh, for most of the hi-fi people were put in anechoic chambers, sort of this kind of germ-free environment uh, <clears throat> without any other influences and that the specs on were, were measured sort of, uh, you know, uh, in the absence of other variables. Whereas Bose, uh, his acoustics was based upon putting a speaker in a room, much like the room you're in now. Um, <clears throat> so he was really, uh, his whole idea, um, <clears throat> was to uh, 
uh, get in kind of lived environments rather than kind of uh, anechoic chambers. <coughs> so to demonstrate this, now this is uh, Edmund Dewan invited Bose down to the Air Force Cambridge Research Lab to give a demonstration of some of this sort of new thinking about acoustics. <coughs> and this one demonstration he, he had was uh, he read a, a poem into a, <coughs> a, a microphone and tape recorder, um, uh, played that recording back out of the room, recorded that, and et cetera, et cetera, and, <coughs> and pretty soon it sounded like bells. So um, uh, Edmund told uh, Alvin about, about this, and he, had, he was, Alvin wasn't at the demonstration, but he thought, you know, well, that's a good idea. And that's, <clears throat> that's where uh, I'm sitting in a room uh, comes from. And so that's the, the, the idea of spatiality and room resonance, uh, sort of lived, lived in spaces versus kind of the, the anechoic uh, uh, philosophy of Cage. That's the, that's the difference between uh, this, <clears throat> you know, kind of the, uh, the difference between the two. Uh, I have a, oops, let's see, that's not sure. This, this is just a real short, this was Alvin in uh, last year in the Bay. So this was uh, a, a year ago. <clears throat> the, um, he, he thinks about the music for solo performer as sort of an equivalent uh, of four minutes and 33 seconds. You know, it was, uh, it was, <clears throat> there was this combination that Edmund Dewan and John Cage, uh, John Cage sort of gave him the license to do things. It was also because of John Cage's friendship with uh, Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg, who were in the collection of the Rose Art Museum that, uh, at Brandeis University that Alvin could go to the, to the museum and get the sort of the funds and the, get the cooperation to do this, uh, what has now become a, a famous concert. Uh, Cage did uh, Rose Art, as in Rose Art Museum, Rose Art Mix. Uh, this sort of kind of Fontana mix with these tape loops. I don't know if you've seen it, these tape loops that are like 50 feet long and people holding up their fingers, you know, the, uh, with the loops going over it. <clears throat> and just, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, piece. He also did uh, zero minutes and zero seconds. And it, it was the premiere of the um, of, uh, music for solo performer as well. <clears throat> and in fact, after it, uh, well, during it, just to get, I hate to, not really, I hate to uh, um, talk about the Brandeis composers, <laughs> but during it, uh, <clears throat> uh, two of uh, Alvin's colleagues, one of them uh, did a hot foot on the other, you know, like a match, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and they were, uh, one of them was pretending to sleep during the thing, and <clears throat> but uh, and anyway, but, um, but during the uh, applause afterwards, uh, Alvin uh, introdu uh, actually introduced uh, Edmund as the co-composer uh, for the piece. But he, he sees it as a form of four minutes and 33 seconds uh, because 
uh, only by not performing do you perform. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, usually music performance has some action. You know, so it's only when in this sort of total inaction that you are performing. So it's just like, uh, you know, David Tudor up in Woodstock withholding the, uh, uh, you know, withholding the performance on, you know, not doing the expected performance. Uh, so there's a, there was a, yeah, only by not performing is, he, uh, is there a performance. So he, he, he liked the, uh, the conceptual uh, aspects of it as well. Yeah, Edmund, in 1970, there was this thing called the Mansfield Amendment. Uh, so it was actually the Democrats who were trying to do this stuff uh, to make it more difficult. The military was funding 80% of non-medical, non-agricultural, uh, research in the United States through universities and, and military research centers and private research centers. And so to sort of put a, uh, some restriction on <clears throat> the militaries, might they, uh, you know, so to try to end the war in Vietnam or at least to not have, uh, give the military uh, so much power, they said that any type of research had to be directed to military applications. So all of a sudden, these scientists that would had a lot of free time on their hands or, uh, <clears throat> uh, and were, were put into more classified things. Edmund went into, uh, this sort of relates to uh, what you asked before, <clears throat> went into uh, gravity waves. These are not gravitational waves, these are gravity waves where the you know, surface uh, uh, between, say, uh, the air and the water, or between different layers in the atmosphere, the turbulence that happens uh, in them. And he, this was, you know, in 1970, he was doing stuff for not telemetry, but laser. Uh, uh, so, <coughs> and <clears throat> the, the thing is, he, you know, a lot of the stuff is still classified. But he, he was saying that he liked this work better uh, because it was it was sort of more mathematically challenging, and he was you know primarily a, a mathematician. Uh, so the the other thing that um, that Edmund told Alvin about, and I'm, I'll, I'll start wrapping it up here, um, was that if you like the you know, if you like the idea of this sort of naturally occurring electromagnetism, and Alvin started using the term natural <coughs> electromagnetic sound. If you like the idea of the, you know, the sort of brain waves, electromagnetic uh, phenomena making sound, then I, I know some people in the, my colleagues in the AFCRL who are doing ionospheric radio. Um, he, uh, didn't Alvin didn't contact them, but he did um, start doing things with uh, natural radio, and he did a piece uh, uh, that was uh, using using these sounds. Let's see. Uh, this was from uh, you know that uh, this. Uh, Emery Cook it, uh, sort of a big influence on a lot of composers and a lot of, uh, he started issuing these uh, well some of the first stereo records there's a, these like two arm uh, uh, tone arms uh, the two sideless tone arms um, but also started issuing the science uh, stuff the, uh, the voices of the satellites that we heard uh, earlier I think we're Cook recordings that might might have been something else, but um, but he uh, approach he started approaching these scientists and and saying, you know, let's get these sounds uh, sounds out. So these earthquake sounds and uh, Millet Morgan was a uh, atmospheric scientist uh, up at Dartmouth. He um, Emery Cook uh, knew, knew him and said, uh, you know, let's get some of these sounds uh, on on record. 
So a lot of it is sort of didactic. You know, this is kind of popular science sort of explaining the phenomenon. But there's passages in it when it's just for your listening pleasure. So this is where the out of this world sort of goes into different types of whistlers and other atmospheric radio phenomena, natural radio. And some of them are slowed up, but a lot of them are at the speed at the same speed. And so this is what Alvin used in whistlers. He used he had a recording of this that he ran through some sort of some filters that student of his that some of you might know that Richard Lerman devised for him. Yes, yes, this would be possible. That would be an exciting discovery. Yes, it certainly would. Real exciting. So there was a I'm going to yeah, like I was telling Lucas yesterday, I've sort of gone into my Bucky Fuller phase that, you know, I I can talk for <clears throat> he used to like talk for hours. Um, I'm really <laughs> I'm trying to cut. Um, he used to, <clears throat> uh, you know, talk for three or four hours. Big. Uh, I saw him talk <coughs> once for three or four hours. And, and then he um, uh, the, the auditorium, you know, the 250, 300 people was there start whittling, <laughs> whittling down after, you know, he'd get down to about 50 people or so. They'd go off to some smaller place That's because right. they'd close down the hall. And then he'd get them, you know, talk for a few more hours and get them down to, you know, like a table full of people. He'd just, uh, he'd only take uh, cat naps. He'd just have like these 15, 30 minute, he wouldn't sleep like eight hours at a time. Um, so the brain waves to, uh, to outer space. The actually, I haven't. Uh, I don't think I've talked about. Uh, the, yeah, the, the whistlers themselves, and this is the one thing that was finally known in the um, the early 1950s. Although Thomas Watson and other folks in the uh, late uh, uh, or the latter quarter of the 19th century were hearing natural radio. Uh, it, <clears throat> it, uh, because they didn't, uh, didn't know about the magnetosphere, there was no way to explain how 
these radio, natural wave occurring radio signals could travel so far to be sort of dis, uh, dispersed into these bosons. And the, the way that they're produced is, um, sorry, but I have to talk about this. Uh, the way that they're produced is that it's from a, a full spectrum electromagnetic burst uh, from lightning that then uh, gets, uh, usually just bounces uh, between the ionosphere and the earth. And if they bounce for a while, uh, you hear them as little tweaks. Um, you, well, first of all, you get this and then uh, of the lightning and then these just little sliding tones. Um, but sometimes they, you know, if the, it's really complicated, but if, if it's, the conditions are just right, they'll uh, pitch a ride on a magneto-ionic flux time <clears throat> um, uh, in the magnetosphere and sort of spin, spin around it and go to uh, a conjugate, conjugate point uh, in the opposite hemisphere. It's sort of like a sister city relationship. You know, so <clears throat> if you hear a whistler without the, uh, in it, then it means that the, uh, it's, you're hearing a thunderstorm in the opposite hemisphere. So I'm not sure what the, anybody know what the conjugate point for Amsterdam is? I mean, there's a, uh, you just go down the same latitude and go about five degrees off because it's not, you know, because it's sort of geomagnetic. Um, uh, there was some notion of this that uh, in the early the radio interference in the, uh, uh, in London in around 1912, this guy named Eccles, uh, W.H. Eccles, uh, uh, sort of thought that the radio interference in, in England was coming from North Africa <laughs> for some reason so on. And so, you know, it's sort of the same, uh, same thing. <clears throat> but the, so the, the thing that uh, Alvin liked, liked about this, that, <clears throat> and this sort of relates to what I was saying earlier, was that the, these little tweaks in Busandi, that they were, although they're, you know, just like little shakuhachi wills, <clears throat> um, they're actually being generated by huge amounts of energy, a lightning strike, uh, and traveling tens of thousands of kilometers. Uh, so it's this whole, this poetics based on Earth magnitude and this, and sort of this difference in, in magnitudes. And he, so he's, uh, uh, because he knows that's, that's how they're produced, when he's listening to it, he's hearing that as part of the, uh, as part of the sound, uh, as much as uh, anything else. So he's hearing the the uh, the distance, the, the the space that is gathered up in the sound and the production of the sound. So these are uh, I call them long sounds. The the, the Sonic X catalog uh, uh, for the last Sonic X. The uh, long sounds you always. Uh, Oh, well, not young. <laughs> you know, but there's there's long sounds that are long in their production, uh, <clears throat> so that what you hear is this uh, these great distances in in little in, in sounds. I so, that I was so the um, the one person who took up. Um, and this is where I'll end. Uh, <clears throat> uh, who took up the idea of from brainwaves to outer space was John Cage in Variation Seven. It's the it's known as the transmission piece. Um, and uh, this is a little clip from the movie on uh, documentary on Variation Seven. Uh, this is David Berman. Some of you may know. I imagine he's played it here before. Uh, uh, beautiful guy. Uh, he was in Variation 7. He was on the brainwave. So this is, uh, <clears throat> uh, so we'll do the brainwaves first. I remember when I was wired up for brainwaves, 
that was one thing I did. And uh, the brainwave uh, amplification, of course, came from Alan Lussier. And John gave credit to uh, Alan. I mean, I think technologically, that was probably the most sophisticated part of the experiments in art and technology, which was to uh, use high tech in a way that hadn't been done before. I think that was probably the most interesting side of it in John. Hesitant. Uh, so the the brain waves, or I mean, that, those were the brain waves. The outer space, um, uh, uh, John John Cage wanted. Uh, he was working with Billy Cliver. He wanted to do a live feed of radio astronomy uh, from the Bell Labs. Uh, he didn't know it at the time. So this is. Uh, this was the antenna that, uh, uh, what's his name, Kompner, I'm forgetting his first name, uh, at Bell Labs, wrote back to Billy Kluver and goes, eh, no, let's forget about it. You know, uh, just use a white noise generator. It's just, you know, you don't, you don't need to do this big feed from from this antenna. Of course, the, the antenna, this antenna was first used to uh, for the echo satellite and for bouncing, uh, registering the e passive uh, communication satellite and for bouncing signals off the moon uh, as sort of a kind of a registration for, for kind of a navigation for satellites. It was also, as you know, where uh, Pentheus and Wilson, um, you know, were getting this constant noise in the antenna, even though they had this cold loading that got down to 40 degrees Kelvin, they were still getting this noise. They thought, you know, they thought of something wrong with the antenna. There was a bunch of pigeon shit in it, so they cleared it out, and it was still the noise, you know. <clears throat> so it wasn't the pigeon shit, it was the sound of the echo from the Big Bang. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so yeah, you got your choice of vision shit or a cosmic microwave background, <clears throat> and they made the right decision. So that was in 1964, so 1966, uh, end of 66, uh, for the prep, uh, preparation. But <clears throat> the, real, the real interesting thing is, um, so that was the, uh, oh, so instead they couldn't do that, so they used Geiger counters. Well, they, they, it was supposed to be for two Geiger counters. There was one Geiger counter uh, <clears throat> uh, that where you could get uh, cosmic, uh, cosmic rays. Uh, so that was the sound of uh, outer space uh, in their recipe for, for variation seven. The interesting thing is <clears throat> um, Carl Jansky, uh, when he was, uh, he's the person in the late 20s that had this direction finding antenna that was a constant high frequency in a radio interference and he, his job at the lab was to figure out what was causing it and how to get rid of it. And he started tracking it over the course of a few years and realized it, could, it was extraterrestrial. Doesn't mean, you know, little you know, green, uh, green people, but, <clears throat> uh, but it was, uh, and he, he's, he located it as coming from the uh, center of the Milky Way, center of the galaxy. And that year, uh, there was a live feed <laughs> uh, from uh, the, 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 the telescope uh, to uh, NBC in New York City. Uh, not the armory where, you know, where uh, the Variation 7 <coughs> was held, but there was a live feed. And it was broadcast nationally. And it was like this really sort of hip announcer uh, that <clears throat> I was going to name my uh, book this. But he was, he was uh, urging the audience. He was sort of explaining the magnitudes and the, you know, the, uh, he goes, when you're listening to this, you have to listen to the static within the static. <laughs> that, you know, it was a real, uh, I guess this is a, Listening. It was the listening, nationally broadcast listening uh, <laughs> session on noise in 1933. So yeah, and then once again, you have to listen to the static within the static. So that was the um, 
So it couldn't be arranged in the 1960s, but uh, people that are uh, already in the 1930s uh, listened to um, the sounds of outer space. So, yeah, uh, by 1972, this is the last one, 1972, uh, Mike Douglas Show, daytime television, uh, this John Lennon, Yoko Ono with David Rosenboom, um, I'm forgetting the synth player. Um, uh, Chuck Berry wasn't uh, roped up for, with the electrodes, but uh, he was there, and they were doing great wave music. Um, um, <clears throat> Alvin was saying that you know that he was doing brainwaves sort of before it became sort of a countercultural uh, thing to do. It's it's an interesting space between sort of Cold War and counterculture that uh, Alvin and a lot of the experimental composers at the time occupied. They, it was explained to me by one of them that they were just, they just drank alcohol, they didn't smoke dope. So yeah. that, was, <laughs> and that was the difference between, they never, so they were based in this sort of Cold War material culture, but never got you know into the counterculture. That's also kind of a Boston West Coast thing. Yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well that's uh, that's it. Uh, is there any questions, <coughs> comments? If not, at least you've managed to. Uh, I don't think you've managed to scare anybody away by <laughs> talking this long. Um, in any case, no questions then. So I want to thank you a lot, uh, Douglas, for this talk, for this listening session, and giving us a chance to see this rare stuff. Um, thank you all for coming. There's a bunch of interesting stuff coming up. Uh, if you have, if you by accident are have to be in Austria next weekend, uh, travel to France. On, on the Donau, uh, where we have the Contraste Festival, where Douglas Kahn is also speaking again, and there's, we have, we is a song of have the Arcosmonium there again, this big loudspeaker installation of the GRM. Uh, we'll play old computer stuff there, but also a new commissioned piece by Keith Philip and Whitman, Louis Jeffrey, Jules Aubry, and some others. Uh, then next week, Monday, the, there is a letter is time, I think, of 21st of October. No? I had it in my email. <laughs> anyway, you check out the email and check out the time. <laughs>